Today we're covering 10 beginner mistakes to avoid when installing vinyl plank flooring. I'm Brad from Fix This Build That, and the first thing you need for a vinyl plank install is a good surface to lay it on. And that meant ripping out the old carpet from this room. I'm doing this project at my brother-in-law Jason's house, and for easy removal, we cut the carpet down into strips. Now this way you can roll it up and haul it out in manageable pieces. Now the carpet is held down by the tack strips along the wall, but the carpet pad is held down by staples. As you pull up the pad, they might come out with it, but you're going to need to pull out any remaining ones with pliers. Now we cut and rolled up all the carpet, and then tied it and the pad up and hauled it out of the room. Then we could remove all the tack strips. Now these come up pretty easily with a pry bar, but they are very sharp, so be careful or wear gloves. And now this brings us to our first potential mistake. All right, with all the carpet and the padding out now, we need to make sure that all the fasteners that are holding down the subfloor are down below the surface, because that's something you really want to make sure is not there, because that will transfer through to the flooring. Now you can use a flat edge like a scraper or a pry bar and run it over all the fastener heads you see. Now if it snags on anything, then you're going to need to sink it below the surface or remove it. We had some raised nails which we found and we just hammered those down flush, but we also found a bunch of screws that were sticking up too. And Jason's dog, Copper, decided he wanted to get in on the inspection too. What's up, homie? Can help check out this floor? And the screws we found just spun when I tried to drive them below the surface. And I realized it's because they missed the joist during install. So we just backed them out and removed them. And whoever was installing this subfloor seemed to be struggling to hit the joist on that day. Third time's a charm, right? Now the next mistake is probably more a matter of an opinion. Leaving the baseboards installed definitely makes the job easier and it's pretty common. But you'll need thick cord around to hide the expansion gap as well as the gap between the height of the lower floor when you're taking out carpet. Now, I think the payoff of removing the baseboards is worth it for a nice clean look, but let me know in the comments what you think. Would you rather put in the work to avoid the cord around or just push the easy button and let it stay? We used a trim pull tool which works really well to keep the boards intact and we even gave my niece Natalie a little sweat equity in her new room. And next we needed to check the floor to see if it was flat enough for the flooring install. We used a long bubble level to span across different areas and look for any dips or humps. All right, so we checked the level of the floor and what we found is right here, we have a nice dip. And you don't want that because that's gonna mean that the floor is gonna translate and you might have some uneven gaps or worst case, some clicking when you step on it because there's a gap between it and the subfloor and when you step on it, it goes down. Now to fix the dip in the floor, we used Thinset that Jason had left over from a tile job. A floor patch is a better product to use here, so if you're buying a fresh bag, go ahead and grab that instead. You can feather it out a lot easier. Now we laid down the Thinset and pulled a strip of wood across it to level it off, though that piece didn't work very well. So this turned out to be a lot bigger. As you can see, we started here and we realized that the dip kind of extended all the way out. And the problem was, is I was using this small screed, uh, which wasn't fully going over the dip. So as we went out, we saw it was larger and larger. With the floor totally prepped, we could start install. And since we were starting at the corner where the door is, we needed to set up our transition now. We're using a T-molding transition that snaps into a metal channel. I marked the U-channel to fit the doorway and Jason cut it to size with a hacksaw while I cut the carpet and padding back out of the way. Now, there were some tack strips that went into the hallway so we used the multi-tool to cut those off. And then I could install the U-channel, but not before an unannounced inspection by Copper. Now, apparently things looked good so I set the channel in place and screwed it down to the subfloor. And this leads us to mistake number four, not undercutting the door jams and trim. And with the U-channel in place, I could tell how far I needed to cut the trim down. I used the multi-tool and a piece of scrap flooring to cut it flush. If you don't undercut the trim, you'll have to scribe the flooring around that trim and use caulk to cover any gaps that you might have. This is not going to look good and it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Starting in the left corner of the longest wall near the door is a good rule of thumb. But with four foot planks, you don't want to end a row with less than an eight inch piece. And you can avoid this by adjusting your starting plank. Now here's a quick example using our room. The length of the first row is 141 and a half inches and dividing that by our plank length of 47 and 5 eighths of an inch shows we could fit just under three boards in that row. But what if that row was 145 inches? Well then we'd be left with a tiny piece at the end. And to fix that we could cut the first plank shorter. So cutting 10 inches off the first one would extend the last one by the same 10 inches. 
So that's how you can avoid small pieces at the end of any row. And we vacuumed the floor to remove any dust and debris and then started laying the first row. The boards snap and lock together and with a few strikes of a rubber mallet, the joint is locked. The third board in the row did need to be cut just like we calculated earlier. And instead of measuring for the cut, it's easier to flip the board around and push the end against the spacer on the wall. Then you can mark right where that cut should be. Just remember to flip the board end for end so that you don't cut off the wrong side. Now we're using Jason's miter saw for all the straight full width cuts. He did have to flip the board over though because the capacity wasn't large enough for these planks. But you might be thinking, hey, I don't have a fancy miter saw so I can't do this. Well, that is mistake number six. The beauty of vinyl flooring is it can be cut with a wide variety of inexpensive tools. In my first video on installing vinyl plank flooring in my laundry room, I showed how planks can be cut to size by scoring with a utility knife and snapping them along the line. Undercutting door trim can also be done with a handsaw versus a multi-tool. And that same saw or a handsaw can be used to cut the vinyl as well. So don't let the lack of fancy tools be the reason to hold you back from this. Now the first row assembled, we slid it up against the wall in one piece against some quarter inch shims that we cut from damaged planks. But we did have some unevenness on that wall that we needed to deal with. We added some plastic adjustable shims that come in the flooring install kit that we were using to deal with that uneven wall. I'll link below to this install kit as well as to the exact flooring that I'm using and all the tools for this job, including the inexpensive options. For the second row, we cut a board in half to start off, which would leave us a nice stagger between that first row. At this point, the planks start locking into one another along both the long edge and the short edge. I find it easiest to lay in the long edge first and securely lock it in place using a mallet and tapping block. Then the short edge can be locked in with a mallet and some taps on the end of the plank will close up any gaps you have. Now we worked our way onto the third and fourth row, staggering the seams of the first planks by at least eight inches. Now you'll notice I wasn't completing full rows at this point because we wanted to deal with the corner by the door first and make sure there weren't any issues there. Now the fifth row needed to be notched to fit around that corner. And using a rafter square, we measured and marked for the cut. And thankfully that board that we cut had a good size strip that would go to the wall and we just cut it with a jigsaw. Now, if there was a thin sliver on that board, we may have had to cut the first row to adjust to make sure we didn't have any issues on installing the next rows. After that, we started filling in the rows that we'd left open, but that led to mistake number seven, which I didn't even realize I'd already made. All right, just as we got this in, I realized I actually messed up on the layout of this first one. So here's what's gonna happen. Uh, if we put a full piece down here, it would come to right about here. And what you wanna do, if you're gonna come into a corner like this, you really want an entire piece to go between the corner and the wall, because that way it's gonna have a lot of structure. So we're gonna actually take this out, and you can see how easy it is to actually take it out. And if you have a problem, you can just remove it and move on and take care of your mistake. We separated the boards row by row until we got to the one with that far corner. We installed a smaller plank at the front of the row and this effectively pushed the rest of the row down and left us with a nearly full length piece at the end. After cutting that board to length, we could lay out for the notched corner and Jason cut it out with a jigsaw again. As he installs the piece, you can see how that small offcut is now supported by the full length of the board. But this is much better than a small floating piece tied in at the end. We laid down a couple more rows using the offcuts at the end of one row to start the next one. This does a great job at getting your stagger right. And through this whole install, we did our best to avoid mistake number eight, which is laying similar patterns next to each other. Instead of working straight out of the boxes, we unpacked the flooring in a space near the bedroom. We stacked it into eight different piles, one for each different pattern. And as we installed the floor, we just kept rotating through the different stacks to try and keep similar patterns at least one board apart. Now keeping this in mind will help you avoid a potential eyesore later. We worked our way across the room until we hit the closet door. And this was fairly easy to work around though. We just measured where that bump out happened to be and cut a U-notch in a plank and slid it in place. And now we could finally get into a groove and lay more than two rows before hitting an issue that we had to work around. Now, as we got to the far wall, we ran into an air vent in the floor and a mistake number nine. Now this vent fell right in the middle of the width of our board, which was great. If it had have overlapped a long edge, we really couldn't have helped that. But what we really wanna do here is adjust where it hits along the length of the board. So we cut and installed a plank before the vent so that we'd have at least eight inches before the vent when we started that new plank. 
we used a carpenter square and a right angle to transfer the location of the vent where we needed to cut on the board. And keeping the cutout away from that short edge helps keep the integrity of the locking system intact, and it also just looks better in my opinion. And we made the cutout using the multi-tool again, but this could also be done by drilling a starter hole and using a jigsaw or a pull saw. After the cut, the vent fit right in place, and Jason actually replaced that later with a nice nickel finished cover. Now for the final row of this bump out, we need to cut the planks down to some narrow strips to fit. We did this using the jigsaw again, riding up against a T-square that we had clamped down to the board. You could also cut this with a hand saw, a circular saw, or best yet, a table saw if you have it. We laid the pieces in and had to use a pull bar to pull them tight. Now this is the same bar you've been seeing us use at the end of a row to pull those boards tight as well. We ran those skinny strips up to the end of the bump out, and then we transitioned back to full width pieces to finish up the room. Now Jason hammered in those last rows and it was looking really good. And we went back to the doorway and installed the transition strip into the channel. Now, even though the vinyl plank was a little bit lower than the carpet in the hallway, the transition worked perfectly and held it tight in that U channel. And the biggest question I got from my last video was why I didn't use any underlayment, just like I didn't here. Well, that's mistake number 10. This product has the underlayment built onto the back and it doesn't require an extra barrier. It actually voids the warranty if you do use one. So follow your manufacturer's recommendations and do what they say versus listening to people in the comments. Now Jason is gonna be replacing the baseboards like I mentioned earlier, but here's a look at how nice it's gonna look not using the quarter round. And we only had one step left, the final inspection. Now everybody came in to check out the new floor and they loved it, especially Natalie and Kyle. Hey, if you wanna see some other My Flooring videos, I got a playlist queued up for you right there. I've done some other installs you might like. If you're not subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that if I earned it. And until next time, get out there and build something awesome. Well, that's all.